Hello everyone, today's new episode on layman terms and um, it's a unique ex- episode because this time I'm going to look at an overview of Liverpool and this is a completely new thing. I've actually been meaning to do this for some time, never really knew what to do, but the Premier League season is going to start in a few days. Um, let's check when it starts. So don't get me wrong, I love Liverpool. I've been a fan since 2004, I guess. Um, But, you know, I've stopped watching the transfer news, basically. Because um, I think this is the first time I have just completely blanked it out. Um, And it's been good for my health. Let's just put it that way. Um, Nothing wrong with it. I mean, I started doing that since January. Especially since Liverpool Echo started doing some nonsense um, you know, putting Kylian Mbappe content every single day. And I was like, I mean, I just checked out at that point. You know, I remember posting in the comments, you know, Kylian Mbappe derangement syndrome, you know, um, similar to Trump derangement syndrome. Um, if that means anything, I guess. So the Premier League season starts on the 13th of August. Yes, you can see my screen. 14th of August, 15th of August. We are playing Norwich, which is interesting. It will be a good start to the season if we can beat them. But So the Premier League starts on the 30th of August. We are on 7th August, so there's one week to go. And I thought, hey, why not do an overview for the coming season? Um, Maybe we'll go... Maybe I'll just show you a little of last season recap and why I think this season is what it is, right? So... uh, uh, maybe I can, you know, show you what my prediction was for last season. Um, twenty 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 one. You know, um, we had the pandemic, but who cares, right? So my prediction was Liverpool won, and I I actually thought Liverpool or Man City, right? So. Um, I wanted Liverpool to win, but I was just a realist and I thought, okay, Man City also have a chance. Third place for me, I thought, would be Chelsea because they made a lot of signings last season and all of those players are very good and they're very young too. I mean, I'm expecting Chelsea to be much better than they were last season. I expected uh, Manchester United or Tottenham. I mean, I was more inclined to Tottenham, actually. I just thought Tottenham would be fourth. And um, Man U will be five. After that, I didn't predict anything because, you know, I was was high. We were were winning. Uh, We won the Premier League. I didn't care about anybody else. But I did think that maybe... Maybe Leicester City, City and Arsenal. I thought about that. And I thought Everton... Everton made some good signings, if we're being honest here. Um, You know, so this was my prediction. And let's see how it turned out. It was terrible. My prediction was terrible in the end. Look at that. Manchester United came second. And um, frankly, I didn't expect this. Um, This was very surprising to me. But uh, basically what you saw was not only Bruno Fernandes, because in 2019-2020, Bruno Fernandes really carried that Manchester United team um, all the way to the top four, basically. Um, if I'm being absolutely honest here, uh, what a performance! But he took them to the top four, and this season you got Paul Pogba, Bruno Fernandez, and then you got all these other players. I think uh, the black back line for Manchester United improved a lot, uh, which was very surprising. So, um, how did it turn out? So basically. I actually thought the top four would be locked in, but it seems I was wrong. Uh, the actual was Man City. So the actual was Manchester City, Man U, Liverpool, Chelsea, Leicester, and. Um, 
Sorry for the Leicester spelling. I think it's wrong. Yeah. yeah so this is how it ended up. Um, Tottenham finished seventh, which is interesting. I guess it goes to show, right? You, they were overperforming under Mauricio Pochettino, if we're being absolutely honest. Uh, I think Jose Mourinho did an okay job for first season. But um, anyways, you know, West Ham United had a dream season. Um, I'm surprised David Moyes actually does pretty okay with smaller teams. It's the bigger teams that he cannot handle. Um, Chelsea, I think, did very well. Um, and the reason I say that is because Thomas Tuchel, that is his first season in charge. And there were a lot of new players. So usually when there are new players, it's difficult to get them adjusted to. But let's be honest here. They are very good players. Extremely, extremely good players. Right from the back till the front. Every single player. Um, I would take for Liverpool, if I'm being honest with you. With a few exceptions, everybody I go, I will take into that team. Um, so I guess Chelsea have actually done well. It was us who underperformed badly. Um, but this was what actually happened. And if you look, I guess, Leicester and Tottenham. That was the only thing I got wrong. Everything else, kind of okay, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, don't punish me. This was what I thought would happen at the beginning of the season. This is what actually happened. And basically, that's it. So, um, why did that happen, right? Let's see why Liverpool couldn't do anything. Right, what happened, and obviously we know that, you know, the minute we lost Virgil van Dijk, I was of the thought that maybe we might handle it, but I also thought this is terrible. Virgil van Dijk is a single important guy, and we lost Virgil van Dijk to Everton, and I don't know if you guys remember, we had a horrible day. We had a horrible day against Aston Villa previously, where we lost um, 7 2, I think. Yeah, this was a terrible day. I remember seeing the game and thinking we were making the same mistake for every single goal. We were too far high up, right? Trent Alexander Arnold was kept, could do nothing because Aston Villa, what they did was they took the ball in the right wing, crossed it to um, Trent Alexander Arnold's side, and Trent Alexander Arnold was was in no man's land. He always was caught napping, and I think out of the seven goals, three or four goals came from TAA's side, and that was with Virgil Van Dijk. So I was already not very very happy with this. Um, I didn't think it was the end of the world, but I didn't expect Liverpool to win the next game. So usually, what happens is when teams lose this big, and this happens every time. With the smaller teams especially, you know, the smaller team comes in, they lose big, and then they don't really recover for two or three games. So considering that, we drew Everton, which I thought was a good result. But what was terrible about this game was both Virgil and Dyke and Thiago Alcantara got um, injured. And, you know, um, I don't know. I've ha I have a hard time just thinking why Pickford would do some nonsense like what he did. Um, uh, yeah, this was the substitution that killed us, basically. But what is interesting is that Virgil van Dijk was the reason why we were pushing so high up during those first four or five games. If you noticed, throughout the game, he would usher people forward. He would tell, come forward, come forward, you know, close the gap. And I guess it made sense from Klopp's perspective because um, he's brought in Thiago Alcatra to, you know, make solve the issues that Liverpool have in the middle of the park, attacking-wise. You know, Liverpool, with Henderson and Vinaldum, all we do is pass to the side, pass behind, pass to the side, pass behind. And so, to solve that, he brought in Thiago Alcatra, which is, I think, one of the first transfers you can visibly see what Klopp tried to do. With every other transfer, it's kind of hidden. There's subtle meaning to it. But this was very important on what exactly Klopp wanted. And it showed... Um, and so he wanted to close the gap so that, you know, Thiago Alcatra can put his mind to work and basically bring those passes that will basically shred defenses. You can see why he wanted Liverpool to push forward. But what I would say is that 
Liverpool, we were excellent defending during our Champions League winning season, season two, t- two years ago. Um, last season, when we won the Premier League, I wouldn't say we were great defending. We were good, and we were good enough, I would say. But we were not, like, great. We were not flying. And the reason is because when you have a formula, right, what you do is you improve it year on year. And Klopp has done this, right? Klopp does this year on year improvement. And in fact, he even does a lot of mid-season adjustments to the team. And frankly, this is one of the reasons why I don't look at the transfers anymore because I trust Klopp. Klopp actually has got a great transfer record. You know, I think he's one of the best managers when it comes to transfers. Um, Brennan Rogers was a train wreck on transfers. Um, the reason I say that is because Klopp is unique in that he trusts the team that Liverpool have put in. Right Now, maybe a lot of them are just techies and they're, they're not looking at the matches. They don't understand the game. But the truth is that there is some value to technology. And I guess Jürgen Klopp has embraced the fact that he needs scouts. Right? Uh, in, in, in other words, if you look at Brennan Rodgers, he will tell you, uh, I had a list, I gave it to the team. It, it doesn't seem like happening. And it's very similar to what Jose Mourinho does, does right? Um, he takes a list and he gives it to the team and he expects the team to bring those players in. Now, in the modern day, with the amount of leverage uh, teams have to put in uh, monetary-wise to get transfers done, I don't think it's 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 a good idea to give managers all the power. This is my personal opinion. And um, I've always been wary of that. Right? I've always felt like managers should not have absolute power over transfers. And Klopp, actually, he trusts his scouts. He believes that if the scouts, if he tells them to scout a midfielder and scouts give him 10, play, 10 players, he can choose one or two from them. If he cannot choose, he refuses, right? With Brennan Rodgers, he always felt like he was fighting the team. And, I mean, let's be honest here. That's not how big football clubs work. You can do that in small teams. In a team as big as Liverpool, you just can't do that, right? you got to work with what you have. And as long as you have enough power, which Klopp has, right? He has the final say. If he gets a 10-man list and he doesn't like it, he just says, no, I don't want anybody. And I think if, as long as you have that kind of trust where you can reject the players that are being sent to you um, with the board and everybody, I guess it, it works out. And which is why I think, and again, I don't think every manager should should have the right to have complete sale transfers. Just look at Eddie Howe, right? Eddie Howe is a very good manager. I think he's done a very good job with Burnmouth over the last 10 years. But look at his transfer record. It's it's terrible. Um, if, if Eddie Howe comes to Liverpool, let's say, for example, he does well and we decide to man, uh, take over Liverpool, I will not give him any powers on transfers because he's terrible at it. You know, and so... Klopp is unique in that he is actually good in transfers. So this is one of the reasons why I, I don't watch transfers anymore because I trust Klopp. I trust that he'll make the right decision. And, you know, that's a good segue. Let's go and look at what transfers we have made this season. Right? Um, we have brought in Ibrahim Konate. I think is, this is very important because we don't know if VVD is available at the start of the season. Uh, Joel Matip is injured all the time. Joe Gomez also hasn't appeared for us. So there's a huge question mark as to whether he will come in. Um, and then, who's the other person? Then you've got those two players, right? He played for us the whole season. Why do I forget his name? Nat Phillips. Yes. Now I remember. We had a guy called Nat Phillips in there. Uh, yes, Nat Phillips. Now, Nat Phillips, I think, is good. Um, is he top class? I don't know. Uh, if I had a choice not to choose him for the Champions League or Premier League games, I will not choose him. Uh, but, you know, if I don't have a choice, I still I still think he's a good option. So, Ibrahim Konate, I think, is very important. Uh, because if you actually think about it, Virgil van Dijk himself is 30 years old this season. So, we're going to have to replace him at some point. Right? Why not start now? I think this is a good transfer. Ben Davis came in and he hasn't made any appearance, I think. Um, I don't remember him playing. I think this is an important transfer. Again, because Joel Matip is injured all the time. We've got Joe Gomez, Nats Phillips. I think we need that player right, to, to help us. And I think he's left-footed, if I'm not wrong. So that's a good thing. I'm surprised we didn't buy Ozan Kabak, uh, if I'm being honest with you. He played well. And I think a lot of people don't give him credit because 
let's be honest here, he's 21, I think. So, yeah, he, see, he's 21. I mean, for 21, he, he actually played very well for us. So I'm actually surprised we didn't complete this transfer. I think Liverpool offered less than they than Schalke were asking or something. Um, but I was very surprised we didn't buy Ozan Kabak. And honestly, if we still make this deal happen, we'd be very happy. I think it would be very good for us to do this. And um, obviously, you know, um, we're towards the start of the season. And looking at this, I'm, my mind is already going all these places. You know, where is the midfielder? Uh, where are the attackers coming? Nothing is happening, right? So, I mean, that's not good for us, if I'm being honest with you. We need to refresh our squad a lot more than we have done on the balance of it. And mind you, this is the first time I'm seeing what transfers we have done in, in two months, basically. So I'm surprised we haven't bought anybody else. Um, it is a little crazy. Yeah, we should have bought another attacker. Um, we made an excellent transfer last season with... Um, with uh, who was that? Man, two months I've forgotten all the players' names. Yeah, Diego Jota. Oh, this guy. Yeah, I'm very happy we made this transfer. I think we need another player like Diego Jota, if I'm being honest with you. We do need another player. Um... So this is why I'm surprised we haven't made any transfers. Again, in midfield, also, again, we need more transfers, right? Um, we've lost Thiago Alcatra. Now, as much as I don't like Thiago Alcatra, I think... Uh, sorry, 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 not Thiago Alcatra. Wijnaldum, uh, Jorginho Wijnaldum. As much as I don't like him, I think... Because he's an experienced player, you can always see that difference when he's on the pitch. His experience shows, right? He, he, he doesn't do... He doesn't do what we want him to do, but he does every what he does correctly, basically. He does make mistakes, but in the grand scheme of things, I think he's a good player at the end of the day. So, yeah, we haven't replaced one out, which is, which again, I'm, I'm, I'm freaking about. Uh, but anyways, cool down. So we have uh, sold Har Harry Wilson, Marco Jurek, Camille. Okay, whatever. Um, I'll be honest with you. I don't care. Actually, don't care. We lo we gave Ryan Elton to. We loaned out all these players. Okay, Minamino. I don't know. If there's one injury and there's no Minamino, uh, boy, I'm telling you, all the fans are gonna come up and say something. But yeah, anyways. Except when the burger, he's a young player, so. Yeah, yes. The transfers have been pretty dull, I guess. We should have bought better players. Um, Man City have got Jack Grealish, something I learned yesterday, which it's a good transfer, you know. I know a lot of people hate English players. Jack Grealish, Harry Kane, they're all very good players. I mean, you gotta you gotta give credit where credit is due. These are really good players. Um, I mean, as much as we Liverpool fans hate Ryan Sterling, he's also actually doing very well for himself. So, I mean, Harry Kane is in Tottenham, but you know, we don't know if, if he'll stay there for long. But anyways, it's crazy, right? That we haven't done any transfers. But like I said, these two months have been good. Uh, I haven't looked at any anything related to Liverpool. And I've been happy. And I, that's what I suggest. Don't look at your transfers. Uh, especially because Klopp is there. If Klopp is not there, okay, it makes sense, right? You don't trust the guy in there uh, most of the time. Uh, to show you another example, Mauricio Pochettino himself is not very good at transfers. Uh, he is iffy, right? He does get a little right and then he does get a lot wrong. But he's okay. You know, he's not that bad. Uh, some people are just terrible at transfers. They just, it's, it's like they don't know what they want for their team. And when they watch football, it, it makes no sense. Players they're picking. But anyway. So, let's look at some of our results. They've been, they've been up and down. I think 
one game really summed up our entire season because let's be honest here at the end of the day we did win more games than we drew and lost which is not saying much but you know we we drew and lost 18 games but we won 20 hey look on the bright side always as people from liverpool will say always look on the bright side i guess maybe because i'm not liverpoolian i, I don't get it but you know anyways i enjoy watching liverpool i've been a liverpool fan since i watched football um, and nothing else i always loved liverpool i think the first time was during rafa benitez I always thought that Liverpool was the team that was most hated on because in my part of the world everybody's a Manchester United fan. So I'm like wait a minute, you know. No. I'm not going to support Manchester United. That's crazy. Uh Barcelona and Real Madrid not much of a culture there from where I come from. But anyways, yeah. So this is the game I want to talk about. We won in the last minute. So Last uh, season we won a lot of games by scoring the last 10 minutes and an extra time. This season we didn't do much of that. I think this that is one of the reasons why we didn't get the results we wanted all the time. But this basically sums up everything, right? Alison Becker had to score in the 95th minute for us to win this game against West Bromwich Albion. You know, that just shows that our forward players were not really firing on all cylinders this season. Alison Becker has saved so many goals for games for us, you know. Uh standing in goal ever since he's come here. He's he's actually saved I think every season a minimum of 10 points he's saved for us. This time he also helped us in the attack. So it makes sense that Alison Becker was the one that scored the winning goal in this game. And I think this this week was very important if I'm not wrong because Chelsea and Leicester played this week and where is chelsea and leicester what where is chelsea and leicester okay chelsea and leicester 2021 ah Okay, am I wrong? This was not same time was it? Yes, it's May 16th and Chelsea and Leicester played May 18th or May 17th, whatever. Um Chelsea won 2-1. And I think Leicester by this time were third, I think, and Ch- Chelsea were fourth. And what this game did was it it put Chelsea a little bit forward, but also gave us a chance. to catch Leicester. And I think this is the first time the entire season where we were fourth or something or fifth, but we mathematically had a chance to be in the top 4. I mean, this was the game that actually did it for us. And it was in the same week as our West Bromwich Albion game, which is what made the whole thing crazy. You know, um when we won this game, I knew that we were going to go into the top 4. Until then I was I was like maybe we're going to go in maybe we're not after this I was like yeah we're going in uh, for some reason all season I was not confident we're going to win a game when we go into it but this after this game I knew we were going to win our last two games and uh, I did expect us to finish fourth but we finished third that's an improvement but um what a week this was This was the week that basically I think defines our season. We needed help from another team. We need help from a goalkeeper to score a goal. And we just won. We just won. We uh, we were not great defending. We were good in midfield and we really pressed in attack. But we needed help from others to actually win and surprisingly Chelsea and Leicester lost their last game of the season. Which is why we finished third. Um can very suspicious very very suspicious um i do think on the balance of things a goal difference is not that bad um but we did lose 40 to goals um, that's not good notice how grand rogers lester lost 50 goals i think the previous season they lost less let's see 
Yeah, 41. But, you know, Brendan Rodgers' team always lose a lot of goals. I think we always lost more than 48 goals when Brendan Rodgers was in charge. Anyway, let's stop hating on him. I'm the one hating on him. Just stop it. So, what are my thoughts for the coming season? Okay. What's interesting is that after Van Dyke was gone, we had Fabinho in the back goal. Uh, sorry, in the, in the centre-back position. And he, surprisingly, pulled all the players back. So after this game, if you look at all of our defending, uh, we moved more away from the middle of the pitch. We didn't push high enough, high after this. We went back, we kept going back. We soaked the pressure more. And you will see that in each and every one of these games, right? We were willing to go as deep as possible uh, to defend. Which is why a lot of Liverpool fans at the time were saying, we are not scoring enough goals, right? We, we drew Fulham, Brighton, Man City. And I think it is true. We were not scoring many goals at this time, but we were defending pretty okay. You know, not great, but we were defending okay. Um, this, I think, was just a false flag, if we're being honest. I mean, Crystal Palace, we beat 7 0. I did not see that coming. Nobody saw it coming, but it just shows that Crystal Palace have changed so much, right? And usually Roy Hawkson's team are very combative, they don't give you anything. This game, surprisingly, they gave us a lot of space. And if there's one thing our players are good at, it's exploding space. Um, it was surprising. I've never seen Crystal Palace defend like that, but they did. And they paid for it, basically. It's, that's how it is. You know, Liverpool might have a terrible season, but you cannot play like that against Liverpool. We, we, we will eat you alive. Um, and that's what we did here. We, we ate them alive. Surprisingly, Roberto Firmino had a very good season in terms of goal scoring. Right? He scored nine goals, which is actually good for him, if we're being honest here. In a season where we were terrible in attack, he actually, I think he scored good goals. You know? What Firmino brings is more than goals, I think, and Klopp recognizes that. Okay? However, however, we should have brought in Timo Werner last season when we had the chance. But, you know, I don't know why I allowed him to go to Chelsea. <laughs> but I think um, we should have got him. You know. Timo Werner probably didn't have the best season in Chelsea, but it doesn't matter. Um, five years now from now, we'll be saying something else about Timo Werner. So basically, we should have got him. Um, even if Firmino brings more than that, I think Timo Werner would really change our game. Um, yeah. Which is why I'm surprised we haven't bought any attackers this season. You know, Diego Jota is going to basically replace either Mane or Salah, whoever it is, and he's going to do a pretty good job at it. You know, he's, he's a very good attacker. Um, I don't watch too many other Premier League games um, because... There's nothing much to watch. <laughs> but um, I think Diego Chata is an excellent signing. Uh, I do not see it coming, but, you know, what a player. Um, I just wish he his, Portu Portugal did well because, you know, you want your players to do well, even if they go on international tournaments, basically. And I did wish for that. I just hope it happened. And like I said, the 7-0 was a false flag. Because look at that. We went on a winless streak for, I don't know, how many months. It's crazy. Just look at that. After that 7-0 against Crystal Palace, we didn't win a single game since from 19th December to... Okay, we won one game against Spurs. From 19th December to 13th February. That's two full months. And look at how many games. You know, I think around 10 games. We won one. And we lost under the others. Um, I'm surprised we finished top three after this. Top, top four after this. You know. But it just shows that the Premier League is not 
is very competitive. It's kind of terrible. But um, I do enjoy watching Liverpool. Man City, I do enjoy watching um, too. They play very good football. Um, Pep Guardiola, even if he doesn't win trophies, right? He's an artist, basically. And what he does on the pitch is what's important. You know, if you're a dogmatic lover of the football part, I think his, his dogmatism is, is excellent. If you want to do pragmatism, you have to watch Klopp. Um, Mourinho is the personification of pragmatism, but, you know, who wants to watch Mourinho's teams? Unless they are attacking, and they sometimes do attack, and when they attack, it means that they've, they've nailed it. Defense, yeah. On this point, I just wanted to say, Man City, during the first 10 games, focus fully on defending. And I think this is one of the aspects of football season that a lot of fans don't appreciate, right? Most teams, when they're preparing for a season, they pre prepare in defense, midfield, and attack. That's how they prepare. They prepare um, these settings. I think Man City didn't get much time in the preseason. And so what Guardiola did was, for the first 10 games, Man City were only practicing their defending. Um, which is why I think a lot of people are saying they're defending too much. And, you know, if you watch the ESPN FC stuff, yeah, that's what they said. And I was like, yeah, that's what they're doing. They're going to win the Premier League doing that. Um, I realized quickly that they were going to fly with this. But, you know, anyways... Um, and that my prediction was going to go to the gutter, but that's a very underrated aspect because even if they were defending like crazy, they were winning a lot of their games. They won the majority of their games during that time, but they were defending like crazy. And if you look at them throughout the season, they defended. They defended very well. Man City, for all of their defensive faults, this season is their best for defending, and you have got to give credit for that. And what I've noticed is Klopp always does the defending part of it during preseason. During midseason, he does change the attack and midfield a little bit. And uh, to give you a great example, when Luis Enrique first took over Barcelona, you had the MSN, right? Messi, Neymar, and Suarez. And that's exactly what he did. First 10 games, they defend, They focus on defending, then midfield, then attack. And they did that, right? Man City didn't do that much. Um, they focus on defense, and then they focused on midfield come attack. And uh, that's what they did throughout the season. But Barcelona did that. And you could see towards the end of the season, they were unstoppable. Basically, they won the treble, right? And teams that can do that, and coaches that can actually achieve that, um, are very good, are very good, right? Who knew that John Stones will defend as good as he did this season, right? Um, he's been terrible every single season, if we're being honest. But this season, he played very well. Um, you can see some, some level of why this guy is good. But again, you know, he needs that coaching to be good. Not every player is naturally great like Virgil van Dijk, but you can see why Guardiola did that. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think we would have done that, but we didn't have a proper centre-back pair for six, for three months at least, right? I wouldn't blame Klopp because he does make some questionable decisions sometimes, but that's very rare and that's nitpicking. Which is interesting. One thing that a lot of Liverpool fans spoke during the season was Trent Alexander-Arnold, I guess, is just fed up with right back. I was very surprised Trent Alexander-Arnold liked right back because I think when he, during the preseason of our Champions League winning, you know, after we we won the Champions League and during preseason, he gave one interview and he said, I want to change the way people think of the right back position. And, and I thought that was very surprising. I thought he never had ambitions of right back. And... I guess he said that because he was 19 at the time. And, you know, when you're young, you just say stuff. You're, you're very romantic sometimes. And I guess he said that out of that. 
Uh, and he's probably thinking now he wants to go to midfield. I don't know. Um, because I guess it, 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 he's being exposed, right? Um, for his defensive abilities. It's, it's not very good. Um, and it makes sense, I think, to move him to center defensive midfielder. Um, because his long-range passing is brilliant. And if he can you know, stretch Liverpool in the midfield area and give those passes that we want that you know help connect midfield with attack, it'd be very good. But I doubt um, Klopp is going to do that. If he wanted to do that, he would have brought a right back in. But he hasn't done that. It means Trent Alexander-Arnold is going to be in right back. Um, but I guess it's going to take one bold coach to do it. You know, if Gareth Southgate do, does it, who who knows that? I think that'd be good. But again, when you're coaching a national team, you don't want to change players' positions too much. Um, so again, I don't see this happening anytime soon. But it's possible. Um, I think it will be very similar to how David Alaba has moved. Right? He's he he's moved from left back to centre defensive midfielder, and he moved there because Austria won played him there. And then again to left back in Bayern. And now in order to you know squeeze in Alphonse Davis and what a player Alphonse Davis is. I mean, he, he's nineteen and his speed is incredible. He's faster than when David Alaba was in his prime. Um, I, he's just so fast and he's a very good player. And I guess now he's going to send it back. And I think we will see something like that with Alexander Arnold in the future <laughs> not now but in the future and i think that's very interesting um but i think there are two players that did very well for us this season um, alison becker and andy robertson andy robertson has been brilliant for us year on year um, he just plays game after game after game and he's never injured you know and he's such a such a good player right when it comes to defending He's very good. When it comes to attacking, even he does very well. And in the first half of the season, he didn't get too many assists. But in the second half, he did well. He he got a few assists, I think. Um, so, you know. Okay, let's see how many assists he got. In the second half, he did. He got a lot of assists, and I guess that that was very important. Um, because you could say even in the second half, Trent Alexander also got a lot of assists. So, I think that shows a little bit. Um, oh, wow. Alisson has signed a long-term contract. That's good. That's good news. Ah, Fabinho also. <laughs> oh, if we can get Saul, that, that'd be good. Oh, wow. Okay, signed TAA also. Oh, Van Dyke and Gomez have returned. Huh. Nine days ago. Yeah. <laughs> so much for... Uh... Yeah, I mean, we'll get to this. Another video. Yeah, this is true. I've been shouting out this for five years now. But, uh, you know, Klopp is not listening to us, right? It's... He he listens to the pulse. So if you're in the stadium and he feels something, yeah, he will respond. But he's not going to listen to a guy on shouting into a microphone on the internet. I mean, that's not that's going to happen. Uh, this is not going to happen. Oh, it's 30 days. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, I got carried away. Mm. Why am I looking at ESPN, you might ask? I think the ESPN FC show is a good show overall. They do have some questionable way of doing it. But uh, I think overall they're not that bad. People don't give them enough credit, in my opinion. Um, they're, they're pretty good. Um, everybody else is terrible. You know, watching the Liverpool Echo is like watching propaganda. I'm sorry. That's how I feel about the Liverpool Echo. Where's Andy Robertson? Yeah, seven assists, right? So I, I don't think we all, we, anybody saw that coming, but he scored seven assists. Where's TAA? 
seven assists, right? So in the second half of the season, these guys did did do a little bit in terms of assists. Look at that, thirty. Look at that. It's going. The time's going to come again. Ozan Kabak is twenty one. I don't know why we didn't buy him. Um, anyway, that's another point. So what are my thoughts for next season, right? We have Fabinho, Okatra, Lella, Abi Keita. Abi Keita has been terrible for us, you know. And I first watched him play for Liverpool, which is the first time I watched most of our players. I don't scout players in every league. He was really good. And surprisingly, he plays very similar to Paul Pogba. Um, if you just compare the playing styles, they're very similar. The difference is Pogba is tall and strong. Abiketa is not so tall. And that is a huge disadvantage in the Premier League. Um, I think uh, no, many people don't give credit for how important height is in the Premier League and even other leagues, right? In general, taller players do well. You know. This is a controversial opinion. Sergio Ramos, to me, is not a world-class player. And I think... Steven Nicol is right above that, but he's an excellent player. And if if I were to choose Sergio Ramos, I would choose him to be in my team. But if I'm being objective, he's not a world class player, right? Or okay, he's a world class player, but he's not a once in a lifetime player. Let's just put it that way. You know, Paolo Maldini will always be the best. You know, so I will not lump him in that category. He's a world class player, but he's not great. He's not that great that you should, you know, he's the best of all time. I don't believe that. I don't. But Sergio Ramos has been helped by his height. And I believe that when Ronaldo was in Real Madrid, Ramos practiced jumping with him because Ronaldo jumps very high in corners. I have a feeling that they both, both used to compete with each other in terms of who jumps tall, right? And I have a feeling Ramos found his match with Ronaldo and they fought really hard on those things. And he's a fighter, basically. He's a fighter and he's tall. It's very important. Height is very important. Nabi Keita has gone because of his height and, of course, he's injured all the time. On the balance of things, right? Yeah, Costa Simicas, I want, I want to see more of him, obviously. Um, and I think we will see, but anyway, we'll see. We've got Fabinho, Alcatra, James Milner, Abiketa, Henderson, Oxford Chamberlain, Curtis Jones. Now, Curtis Jones, I've been very happy with. Right? I think this has been the breakout player for us this season. And I think it's, it's a good thing that he came through. He had a very similar progression to how Trent Alexander was. When Trent Alexander first came into the team, he came in because of an injury to someone. I don't remember who. He played against Manchester United. And you can see that he couldn't run. He couldn't keep up. But over the course of the next six months, he he improved a lot. And um, then he became accustomed to the pace of the Premier League. And you could see that with Curtis Jones right away. When he came in, he was not really... There was, there was a gap between the pace that he had and the pace that the Premier League had. But he's adapted very well. He's doing very well. I think he needs to work a little more on his passing, I guess. It's not very adventurous. It's not, very, it's not always thoughtful. But he is a very good centre midfielder. And he makes good runs. He receives the ball well. He does shield well. He... Um, finds players well, but I do think there are many aspects to his game to, that he can improve upon. But, you know, it's very nice that we now have Trent Alexander, Curtis Jones, all these players, you know, in their early 20s playing for us in the first team. This is, it's it's good news, really. Jerdan um, Shakiri, um, he's always a good player. I think he's, um, he's playing, he's played some of his best football right now. Um, I realize it's not much, but I think he's played very well. 
when he's been called upon. Very inventive. Um, I did not expect Shakiri to be an inventive football player, but he is. And I really like that. I really like that he's very inventive, creative in his football. And we do need that in our midfield, right? Um, we need two kinds of midfielders. One that will link, uh, that will just simply cover the, 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 the meters, right? 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters. They will cover the space with, them, with their passing. And then the others that will help creatively cover that space. And Sharon Shakiri is very creative with that. And I think that's, very, that's a great asset to have. Um, I would be surprised if Klopp sells him anytime soon without finding a replacement. I mean, without a replacement, I don't think Shakiri should be sold. Um, if you look at the team sheet, it looks all good. But, you know, Keita is gone all the time. Alex Oxlade is gone all the time. James Miller is getting old, but he can still do the job. So I don't think, uh, you know, it's it's all good there. Because look at this, 30s, 30s. Everybody in their 30s. Curtis Jonas, 20. Um, how old is Henderson? Henderson is also 31. So our midfield is getting old, and we need to do something about that. And again, here, look at this. 29, 29, 29. Diego Jota. Diego Jota is 24. So I do think um, we need to do a lot of work here. In terms of defense, I think we are okay at, the, at this moment in time. We maybe need a right back. Um, the reason I say that is because for some reason, I don't think Rice, Rice William. Oh, sorry, not Rice Williams. Rice Williams is a good player. Nico Williams, yes. I don't think Nico Williams will be here in Liverpool five years from now. I highly doubt it. Um, oh, we have Rice Williams. Rice Williams is a very good player. I do think there are many, many aspects of his game he has to improve. Nico Williams. I'm not really sure. I, I'll be honest, I'm not very sure. I don't think he will be here for a long time. That's just my opinion. And opinions are, you know what they say. Vice Williams, I think, is a... And you can see this with every one of our players. And this is something that frustrates me, right? When we have our young players come from the academy into the Premier League, they're all shocked by the pace of it. They're all shocked by the speed of the game. Um, and it takes time for them to adjust. And the reason it frustrates me is not because they're young and you need to give them time. I mean, these are all given. Because I look at Manchester United's youngsters. They come in and they immediately do well. And that always surprises me, right? So Jesse Lingard, for example, when he first came to the Manchester United first team, I think he was 23. He was old, right? But he was, he, he was adapted to the pace of the game, right? Um, Marcus Rashford, he was adapted to the pace of the Premier League right from the start. Of course, over the course of an entire season, maybe he was not great, right? So he had very good first 10, 15 games, and then he slowed down a little bit. But he was not very far away. Our players, whether that's TAA or Curtis Jones, everybody's just, they're shocked by the pace of the Premier League. And this is one of the things that always frustrates me about what happens in our Liverpool academy there's something happening there that is not preparing these players for the premier league right because in manchester united i bet you go to every single player that has come from the from the ranks they've always just adapted to the pace of the premier league easily and and why is that why is that it makes no sense that they can do it we cannot right and it's surprising because if you look at man city players they also struggle with the pace of the Premier League. But Manchester United players, they don't struggle with the pace of the Premier League. And just to say one point, there's this one player Man City has bought. I don't remember his name right now. Um, he They've got him from the Spanish League, I guess. And what a player he is. Uh, he's a Spanish player. What a player he is. I, I, I've been stunned with the way he plays. Ferran Torres. Um, I remember watching Spain in the Euros, one or two games, and whoa, what a great player he was. He's very good. You know, this guy is very good. He's going places. This is what I'm saying. We need to bring in players like this um, for our attack. We do need these kind of players. Like I said, some, some of these things are just frustrating. 
Why are these players not ready as soon as they come in? I want to know. What's wrong? Right? What's happening in our academy that's not ready for making them ready on day one? Right? You know, of course, over a course of a season, Marcus Rashford, for the first 38 games, his first 18, 15 to 18 games, he was very strong. Then you could see some of that, you know, that, that he couldn't keep up with the pace, the, the length of the Premier League. You know, but he could keep up with the pace, not the length. You could see that. But you see that with every player, in every team. If you look at the first half of the season, and in any Premier League campaign, in any La Liga, in any Bundesliga, Bundesliga season, um, what else is there? A Spanish League, whatever. The first 19 games are always very strong. Players are very fresh. They play each game very, very strong. What happens is teams get into a rhythm and then their their levels drop. I mean, listen, in the end of the in the end of the day, they're human beings, right? And so to be playing 90 minutes every week or every two games every week, it, it's not easy, right? So it takes a toll on your body. And you see that in the second half of the season, not every player, you know, is at his top is at the top of his game. And you always see that with Vinaldum. In the second half of the season, he doesn't last more than 80 minutes, 70, 80 minutes too well. Um, and he has been that way since the very beginning when he came to Liverpool. It's just that last season and the season before that, Klopp substituted him more. But even before that, he was he, he wouldn't last. And I guess it, it's, it's just the way it is, right? Every player does this. And if you see the smaller teams, and I'm going to call them smaller teams because they are smaller teams. If you really want to be a big team, right, get get in with the program and start playing like a big team. I don't like people saying so-called small teams. They're not so-called small teams. They are small teams. Get in with the program. Play well, right? Earn the respect. Leicester City, they earned the respect. I mean, they were 10th. They were middle table. They won the Premier League. And then again, they went to middle table. And now with Brendan Rodgers, they're back. So I respect Leicester City. They're not a small team. But... Other teams are small teams, you know, you got to earn the respect. But with these small teams, you always see that the first half, they're very good. And sometimes you see some of these these unicorn teams coming up, um, taking positions, and you're like, whoa, that's crazy. And then they fizzle out in the second half of the season. Surprisingly, West Ham and Leicester did not fizzle out, um, which is what makes their season great, you know. They had great seasons last season, and... What makes it great that is that they didn't fizzle out. Look at West Ham. They finished sixth. Leicester, fifth. So it shows that they didn't fizzle out. And that's the point, isn't it? It's not enough that you get points in the first half of the season alone. You need to win your second half. And because Leicester and West Ham did do well, they got 65 and 66. Listen, that's just four points away from Liverpool. Right? So we didn't actually win by much. We finished third, but we didn't win by much. And... I think this is very important, right? Small teams have to do well on both half of the seasons. You cannot just play good in the first half. That's good for getting away from the relegation zone. You have to do well in the second half too. The teams that do well do that always finish in the top 10. Teams that do that do finish well in the top 10. Look at Aston Villa. Aston Villa, if you go and look at their first half of the season, you'll be surprised. They play very well. They fizzled out. And that's what happens with all teams, right? You don't play as well as you did in the first half. And that's what these big teams do well, right? These teams that are in the top five, they play first half and then they play Champions League. In spite of all that, they play a very good second half. And that's why they are the top top teams, you know? And Liverpool this coming season have to do that, you know? The slate is clean, it's, it's all zeros. What that means is we cannot say we will finish in the top four this season. We just can't say that. We have to earn our position. Right? We cannot say, oh, 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 oh. We cannot give excuses. We have to play well. Everybody starts on zero. You have to earn those seven to six points within the first 30 games so that you can confirm your top, top four position. And then you get the points to win the Premier League in the next eight games. And that is very important. Very, very important. 
to get that first 76 points as quick as possible is very important. And of course, 76 points in 30 games is, is overachieving, of course. It's, it's, it's near impossible. Is it near impossible? It's, it's, it means you've lost 14 points for the course of the season. Yeah, you need that kind of a season to win the Premier League. You know, uh, I'll show you why. Look at our 2020-2021 winning season. Man City, 81 points. We got 99. We got 99. Look at the season before that. Man City, 98. Liverpool, 97. Chelsea, 90, 72. Eighty six, seventy four, right? So you see, second place is always finishing seventy six, seventy four. That's because the competition, the Premier League, has become big. Look at how many teams are there on sixty points. Eight teams. That's usually not. It usually doesn't happen that way. It means that the bottom teams are playing terribly too. Right? They're getting eaten up alive. Uh, I guess the Premier League will have to deal with this, right? The teams that are coming from the championship, championship or whatever. Yeah, they're not in a good place. And I'm expecting the same thing. If you get 76 in the first 30 games, you're probably on your way to win the Premier League. And we have to aim for that. That's how we have to aim. And looking at this, right, looking at this objectively, I don't know how many transfers other teams have done. What I do know is that Jack Grealish is with Man City. I think Chelsea did one big transfer. I don't remember who it was. Messi is available on the market. So we don't know if Man City are going to get Messi. If Man City get Messi, I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to cry. <laughs> um, <laughs> because frankly, come on, dude. That's crazy. To get Messi in your team is, is, is crazy. Listen, I'm a Liverpool fan. And so I think next season we will see what actually happened, right? So let's... Oh, okay, all right. So let's see our prediction for 2021, 2022. You can ask me what happened next year. Okay. Listen, I'm a Liverpool fan. And I want Liverpool to win the Premier League. But I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I don't think we, we will win the Premier League, if I'm being honest with you. Many of the problems we had last season, I think we're going to have them this season also. And that's unfortunate because I do think our defense will improve. I don't trust our attack. I trust our attack will be, it'll be okay. I hope I just eat bad words. And, you know. Listen, man. I know a lot of you will say, it's a shame that you're a Liverpool fan. I'm going to eat it. I think Liverpool will finish second. Now, this is difficult, right? I don't know if Man Manchester United or Chelsea are going to come here. Uh, yeah. The question then is, is it Tottenham or Leicester? If Mourinho can do well, I guess Tottenham do have a chance of finishing in those positions. And then you've got Everton with that big coach. I don't remember what his name is. I will not be surprised, though, if Chelsea end up running in the title race. Absolutely won't. I think there's a high chance for that, too. You know, so here's how I see the title race going. Rather than say a top four, let me say this. I think the title race will be between Man City, Liverpool, and Chelsea. Manchester United, if they can keep Paul Pogba, Bruno Fernandes, and the other players fit, I think they also will be there. But I don't see that happening. Paul Pogba is speaking at this point. So it's not beyond impossible, but you know, I think this is hard, right? 
I don't watch other teams, which is which is why I don't have much of an idea. But Manchester City are going to play brilliant next season. Ferran Torres, Raheem Sterling, Gabriel Jesus. Oh, they don't have a player, right? So I think that will work against them. But they still have Kevin De Bruyne, easily one of the best players to have played in the Premier League the last five years. And Salah has been very good in his time too. But Salah, Kevin De Bruyne, Virgil van Dijk, Ederson, Alisson Becker, these have been some of the standout Premier League players in the last five years. And the fact that we have five of them, and of course Bruno Fernandes since two years ago. And it's not surprising that the players that have done well have seen their teams also done well. Um, so, so okay, that's interesting. I can bring in standout players. Standout players. Last five seasons. Course, I think Mane is world class. Ederson. Yeah, so of course, this guy has been there only for two seasons, but. I mean, oh sorry, I forgot, Conte, Conte has been brilliant. I would even include Aspilicueta. <laughs> Don't know, Spike. <laughs> These are the standout players, I think, in the last five seasons, and um, if you can play football like how Bruno Fernandes and N'Golo Kante play the game, I think you are you were born for the game. That's what I think. Um, the reason I say that is because what Kevin De Bruyne does, right? If he was a basketball player, he would be the same kind. Uh, creative, passing, brilliant. Um, what Kevin De Bruyne does in football is amazing. It's just amazing, and what a what a player! Like, like he's he's once in a lifetime player. But the thing is, all of his skills are transferable to other sports. If he plays basketball, he plays the same way. You know, the thing about Bruno Fernandez and N'Golo Kante is that the way they play, they were born for the game, and. Paul Pogba is the same. He was born for the game. I think we are very lucky to see the rise of center defensive midfield players you know, who have the tenacity to play such good forward forward play. And we should cherish this time. You know, we've seen Messi, we've seen Cristiano Ronaldo our time. And now we see Bruno Fernandes and Bolo Conte, Kevin De Bruyne. Um, in the future, we're going to see, you know, guys like uh, Leroy Sané. We're going to see players like, you know, Leroy Sané, Alphonse Davis. This is one defender whose name I'm forgetting. And we've seen Rafael Varane before for some games. What a player. We've seen Thiago Silva in our time. But these guys, these Bruno Fernandes and N'Golo Kante, they were born for the game. And that's crazy, you know. It's amazing what these guys do. It's it's unique. It's it's just unique. And if you want to learn football, you learn from these guys. It's as simple as that. And Bruno Fernandes is the only reason why I still think Manchester United will finish in the top four. I think this will be the top four at the end of the day. I don't think any other team has a chance. 
Leicester will come very close, I guess, again. Chelsea will be rejuvenated by Thomas Tuchel, 100%. For some reason, I just don't see Liverpool fighting for the Premier League. It pains for me to say this, but we haven't refreshed our team enough. But I'm a Liverpool fan and I just can't take them off. off. I'm a terrible Liverpool fan. Am I happy with this? So, objectively speaking, this is what I want. In my dreams, this is what I want. Yes, I want to win the Premier League again. Let's see. Chelsea and Man I think this is wrong. I'll tell you what I see happening. Ten. One and one. Way better than Manchester United. You know what's what's terrible about this whole thing, right? What's terrible about this whole thing is I haven't spoken about the Premier League, the Champions League. Okay, so these are my final things. Man City 1, Liverpool 2, Man U 3, and Chelsea 4. And in my dreams, I want Liverpool to win. I think. Um, but we haven't spoken about the Champions League. And I want to shift my focus to that. Because... Oh, no. So, we made it through our group. I think we did okay. I mean, you know, we did pretty well, pretty good. And we drew and lost the game, but, you know, four wins is good, I guess. I think we played well in the... In the round of 16 and the quarterfinals. But we lost. Right. And that's not good news. Oh yeah, Steven Gerrard winning Star Scottish title is very good. I wish he didn't win Brendan Rogers was in the league though. <laughs> and they do Istanbul. And then London and Munich, and it's always the same four places. Get some creativity, Champions League. Get some creativity. Okay. So, yeah, we lost to Atlanta, and we drew against Michelin. Okay, I mean, who cares? The last game, we already threw. We beat Leipzig quite convincingly, and then we lost Real Madrid. Now, here's the thing. Right? Real Madrid were not very good last season. Um, that's why Atletico Madrid won the La Liga. Real Madrid were not good last season, and they got knocked out by... I don't know who knocked them out. So, when we lost Real Madrid, I pretty much that pretty much shows you what position we were in. And that's why I'm still not confident this season. So last season, we had trouble in defense, midfield, and attack. Over the course of the season, our midfield improved like crazy. Right? All our players came back. Thiago Alcatra settled in. And, you know, Fabinho started playing in midfield, which was great, which is 
the way it should be, right? If Fabinho is playing in centre back, we're we're done. Fabinho has to play in midfield, and so our midfield was kind of stable, which is why we we got through the season. Now, and this season, I guess the defence in midfield will be sorted. I I guess if those two are sorted, our attack should be good. You know, why am I being so pessimistic? But I do think that the freshness in our squad is lacking, and that might come to hurt us. You know. I do think that this quarterfinals performance from us in the Champions League is was not unexpected. I I do not see Liverpool going to the finals, and it's the same thing I would say this season. I don't think Liverpool will go to the finals. Now I do want people Liverpool to prove me wrong, which is why even in my prediction I have them at two. Ideally, I would have them at four. Right. So here is what if I were not a Liverpool fan. Here's how my prediction would be. I'm Liverpool at four, but I'm a Liverpool fan, and so this is my stuff. This is what I see happening. It's the same with the Champions League, right? I think Liverpool will. If we get a good draw in round of sixteen, right? Last season we faced Atletico Madrid and we lost. Of course, there were, and we blamed Adrian for it, and rightfully so. But here's the thing, right? So last season we faced Atletico Madrid and we lost to them. This season we faced Real Madrid and we lost to them, and we beat Leipzig. You know, which is not the best team in the in in when you take Europe as an example. They're good in Germany, but that's not a metric. So, it seems that when we face a top up opposition in the Champions League, we're not good enough anymore. Right? And unless that changes, I don't think our Premier League season will be good. I'll be frank with you. If we start playing good against the big teams again, you know, like when we, like when we did three seasons ago, when we got ninety eight points, when we did. Two seasons ago with ninety nine points, and then last sorry, and then two seasons ago with the Champions League. Oh, that was the year we got ninety eight points. So two seasons ago, ninety eight points, Champions League winners. Last season, ninety nine points, and Premier League winners. And the season that just went by, you know, we finished third place and quarterfinals of the Champions League. We have to start beating the big boys consistently. And if we don't do that, I don't think I don't see how we can do well in the Champions League. I just don't think about it. Let's say we get a Barcelona in the Champions League. Um, what is that? Round of sixteen. Okay, Barcelona. We have a chance without Messi, but but that's what I'm saying, right? We have to start beating the big guys. Otherwise, we're not going to do well in Champions League. I'm not going to say it's a knockout competition. I cannot predict knockout competitions. I would say that quarterfinals. If we if we go to the semifinals, I think that's a very good season for Liverpool. Um, I mean, if we're if we finish, if we win the Premier League or the Champions League, either one, I think it's a brilliant season. If we finish second in the Premier League and do semifinals in the Champions League, I think that's a good season too. And that's my expectation, right? But winning either one is a treat. I don't even want to talk about FA Cup and Carling Cup because, listen, FA Cup and Carling Cup are round of 32. And I know this is extremely cynical. We will do much better than this. But, you know, if, if there's one thing I know, Jürgen Klopp doesn't care about this. So, I, I don't see us doing well in these competitions. Um, I, I, that's that's my view. I mean, I know it's extremely cynical, but it's how it is, right? Um, 
fix this. Let me find this. Is so basically that's it. But I guess the first half of the video, um, I made a mistake, and so the quality will not be good. Anyway, thanks for watching.